so I'm Milan, and I'll talk about the recent joint work with Nomi, Cody, and Rafael. Uh, the title of the talk is Continuous Verifiable Delay Functions, and Nomi made most of the slides, so thank you for that. So I'll start with the motivating scenario. So think about somebody who tries to generate a puzzle that takes five years to solve, and the reward is $5 million. So let's suppose we want to use a VDF for this purpose. So Ali starts uh, solving the VDF, but after three years, she runs out of money, uh, and she can't continue the computation. What you would ideally want to do is to be able to do is for Alice to take her intermediate state, sell it to somebody else, say Bob, for $3 million, and Bob would be able to continue the computation for Alice and maybe after five years uh, win the $5 million reward. So if you use a plain VDF uh, the, or generic, the, the generic definition of a VDF, then the issue is that Alice's uh, intermediate state after three years is not verifiable. So she still hasn't computed the proof for the output of the puzzle. So Bob can just verify the intermediate state and the intermediate state might be actually huge. So VDFs don't solve this issue and what the notion that we introduce continuous VDFs is uh, the solution for this scenario. So this is what a continuous VDF is. It's a VDF that you compute in steps, like the VDFs that you know, the, the implementations of the VDFs that you know, but actually every step of the computation is verifiable and not just the, the, the end state or the final state. So you begin by sampling a starting state, state zero, and now anybody can take the ith state and compute from it the ith plus one state. Everybody can verify each step along the way, namely for any t you can verify that the t state is the right state, uh, and the verification is super fast. You don't need to do t steps of computation. So completeness says that you can verify every intermediate state. Soundness sta says, says that there's only one unique uh, t state that verifies, and sequentiality means that if you want to compute the t state, you need to do t states of t steps of computation. So that's uh, the, the f almost formal definition of a continuous VDF. Uh, and as plain VDFs, we'll also allow to use public uh, parameters. So our, construct our result is a construction of a continuous VDF uh, that relies on the fiat mirror heuristic for constant round proof systems and the repeated squaring assumption. Uh, we can also work uh, in any group of unknown order, actually. You'll see. Uh, OK. So we have a bunch of applications. Uh, you get, from this notion of a continuous VDF, you get some notion of a public randomness beacon. It might uh, be applicable for your application or not, but you get some notion of a randomness beacon where you don't need to refresh your randomness every time. We also get a continuous VDF is in particular a plain VDF, uh, and this gives a construction of a VDF from fiat on a constant round proof system, uh, while Existing VDFs uh, are, rely either on a uh, log round proof system or uh, an argument system. We get our sourceable VDFs, which is the application that I told you in the beginning. And we also get uh, more of a theoretical applications to hardness of a classical problem in game theory, uh, the hardness of computing in Nash equilibrium. I won't talk about that part. Uh, you can see the paper. So I'll, I'll briefly say how we construct this primitive. So we start with uh, Christoph's uh, protocol for uh, normal for VDFs. Uh, we start with the interactive protocol. It will be easy for me to explain how the construction works. So we want to prove that uh, x to the 2 to the t is equal to some y. So the prover wants to compute that from x, after doing t uh, exponentiations, you will get the value y. So the prover splits the computation into two parts. He sends the midpoint to the other side. The verifier sends a challenge. And then the prover uh, generates something which we call the combined statement using this formula, which I won't go into, and recursively uh, proves a, a statement about uh, x prime and y prime, both of which uh, are only for t, and, t over two steps and not t. So you continue this for log t rounds, and eventually the verifier can be, conv be convinced if the prover didn't cheat. Um, okay. And uh, Kuzushtov applies uh, fiat Shamir and gets uh, the non-interactive protocol. So let's see how the non-interactive protocol looks like. So this is what the prover does, okay, from the point of view of the prover. 
he starts with the starting point x, and he wants to compute t uh, exponentiations of x, modulo n. So he computes t over 2 exponentiations, gets the midpoint, u, then another t over 2 exponentiations, gets the value y. Now he knows y. And now he starts proving that x prime goes to y prime with t over 2 exponentiations. It doesn't matter how we computed x prime and y prime for the, for the purpose of this part. So you can think about this tree where uh, purple nodes correspond to uh, computation nodes and orange nodes correspond to proof nodes. So the prover perform, does two uh, steps, two long steps of computation and then one step of proof. And then the proof is recursively the same protocol. So again, <laughs> you split the computation into two computation steps and then one proof step and so on and so forth. This is how uh, the view, how the prover in uh, Christoph's protocol uh, sees the computation. And this is clearly, if you want to make it continuous, namely that uh, every intermediate state is verifiable, this doesn't work. Why? Because after the prover computed Y, he has no, uh, there's no proof uh, along the way, so if you just stop the computation at that point, all of the work has gone to waste. Okay, so the internal states are U and Y are not verifiable at this point where Ali stands. Okay, so our solution is actually to make this a tree, a full tree, instead of a, a very unbalanced tree. So every node is going to correspond to a small Christoph proof. So let's see how the, the proof works. So we're going to traverse the leaves of this tree. The, the leaves of the tree correspond to the steps of the computation. So you do two steps of computation and then a proof for those two steps. But you don't want to remember all the steps and the proofs that you did so far. So you're going to merge proofs along this tree, trying to keep your state as small as possible. So this is how it works. You start at the beginning. You compute the proof for the first step that from x you went to x squared. It's a trivial proof. And then from x squared to x to the 4. And then you prove that from x you, got, you went to x to the 4, and you can forget the first two proofs that you had. So you can just merge up and remember only the last proof. Now you continue the computation, and you only need to remember the, uh, the, the green node that we saw before. You don't need to remember the leaves anymore. You compute again two things. You need to remember the two intermediate states. Now you can compute a proof that combines both of the green, uh, the green leaves, and remember only the root, and so on and so forth. And okay, yeah. And once you, oh, shoot. once you uh, you remember all those three intermediate nodes, you can merge them again up and remember only one proof, just by combining the proofs in Christoph's <coughs> protocol. So this is how the computation would go, and eventually you'll have a proof for the final thing, and every intermediate state is ver is verifiable. The question is, how many proofs do we need to store? If you do the computation uh, on this tree, you'll see that your intermediate state is only two nodes per level. OK, uh, do we get a VDF from this? So actually, no, we don't get a VDF. A malicious guy only needs to do the computation nodes, while we actually need to do the proof nodes also. We need to do much more work than the malicious guy. And if you do the math, the, the malicious guy only needs to do t squarings because this is the only thing that's needed to come up with the final value. But we need to do t to the log base 2 of 3 because we need to do mu much more uh, proof uh, steps. So the solution, and yeah, and these two have a polynomial gap, t and uh, t to the log 3. So the idea is to amortize the proof overhead by making the tree have much larger arity. So think instead of having an arity of 3, we're going to have arity k. So there's going to be much more computation steps in every, in every node and only one proof. And the cost of the proof uh, will not grow by much, but the computation will be much, much more expensive. So the, the tree is going to be much more shallow and much wider. And the depth of the tree is going to be uh, log base k of t instead of log base 2 of t. And if you think about k as something like your security parameter and t as some polynomial, then the depth of this tree is actually a constant, uh, which means that the number of rounds in your uh, protocol will actually be constant. And that's why we only need to apply Fiat Shamir on a constant round uh, proof system. 
yeah, so this is this. And now the adversary computes k to the h uh, leaves. Well, we need to compute k plus 1 to the h leaves. And if you do the math, this is just 1 plus little of 1, the ratio between the amount of work that we need to do and the amount of work that the attacker needs to do. So this is the VDF. Uh, the only missing piece is how we, uh, how we extend Christoph's uh, combined function from two parts to k parts, but this is actually quite straightforward. You just choose k midpoints instead of one, and the combined function is a generalization of uh, Christoph's uh, combined function. Okay, so this it is. That's about the construction. And I also wanted to mention one new work that will appear in Eurocrypt that we have the same set of authors. We introduced a notion uh, called SPARKS, standing for succinct parallelizable arguments of knowledge. This is just like SNARKS that you all know and love, but we want the prover's running time to be super fast. So we allow the prover to be parallelized. So the prover is going to be a parallel machine, even if the computation, the underlying computation is not parallel. So we allow the prover to be parallel and we achieve a SNARG or a SPARK as we call it, where the prover's delay is actually additive. So if you give me a computation that takes time t, the prover will generate a proof in time t plus polylog t, while all existing schemes that I know that don't use parallelization uh, have a polylog factor, multiplicative polylog factor, uh, with huge constants also. So this is what we call sparks. Uh, we achieve them from any snarg, actually, uh, with also collision-resistant hash functions, which is a reasonable assumption. And why I'm telling you this, so it's interesting on its own, but it's also related to VDFs. We achieve from it, from this notion, we achieve a VDF uh, just based on snarks and sequential functions. We don't need to iterate a sequential function. And one nice thing about it is that you can plug in a memory hard function inside a snark or a spark and get a memory hard VDF. This is a VDF that it doesn't only take you a long time to compute, but you also need to store a large portion of memory along the computation without ever making it smaller. And hopefully it will have uh, applications. I don't know. So this is it. Questions? All right, thank you very much.